The following presentation is an updated version of a speech given at the New York Press Association Annual Convention in 2008. This presentation is intended for non-photojournalists and especially students considering photojournalism as a career. To see the blog or view my portfolio, follow the links in the video description. Please subscribe to News Eagles, my YouTube channel, to stay informed about new videos. Howdy, I'm Mark M. Hancock, and I'm from Texas. I'm sure y'all are wondering, who is this guy? I could give you all my credentials, but that's boring. Instead, I'll say I've been in the biz a long time. I was a staff photojournalist at the Beaumont Enterprise and the Dallas Morning News. Currently, I'm editor of books and video producer at Squadron Signal Publications. I've won and judged several international pro photojournalism competitions. My art images have won several art and photojournalism awards. I also freelance for several large newspapers and magazines, as well as nonprofit and corporate clients. For the last dozen years, I've operated a photo blog called Photojournalism. For several years, the blog was typically the first or second entry when someone searched for photojournalism on Google. It contains photos, videos, photo stories, and occasional entries about different aspects of the profession. Hopefully, this is enough to establish some street cred. Today, I'm here to answer the question, what is a photojournalist? Imagine effectively communicating in all of the following languages. English and Spanish and Hindi and Farsi and Swahili. If you can already do this, you're one of three things. You're either brilliant, a photojournalist, or a brilliant photojournalist. This is because you understand that you can effectively communicate to anyone anywhere in their language. Photojournalism, a definition. Photojournalism is a marriage of photographic images and words to tell a story. Its purpose is publication. Photojournalism must be truthful, factual, and ethical. At its highest level, it's a sophisticated means of effectively communicating complex information to the widest possible audience. What does it take to be a great journalist? A great journalist cares about people and an ideal world. A great journalist can approach a topic as vast as the universe and make it simple and interesting to both Einstein and new immigrants who are trying to learn the language. The written word has power. With skill, reporters can expose dark deeds and bring them into the light. However, journalism is limited to non-apathetic, monolinguistic people with some time to kill and a few neurons still firing. Enter photojournalism. It destroys almost all barriers. Justice can draw its sword in the time it takes an eye to scan an image. And the image has no age language, or intelligence limits. It's understood by everyone. What is a photojournalist? A journalist tells stories. A photographer makes photos of nouns, people, places, things. A photojournalist takes the best of both and locks it into the most powerful medium available, frozen images. Photojournalists capture verbs. This sounds simple, but confused a room full of professional photographers. Even after a full-length lecture with visual evidence, half of the photographers didn't understand the difference. At the end of the presentation, one man said, So what's the difference between photography and photojournalism? Luckily, two people, only two, turned in and yelled, Verbs. Although photojournalists can make properly exposed and well-composed photographs all day long, they hunt verbs. They hunt them, shoot them, and show them to their readers, then they hunt more. A photojournalist has thousands of pairs of eyes looking over his shoulder constantly. The readers are insistent. What are they doing? What did you see? And what happened? The readers wake photojournalists at night. They keep photojournalists awake. 
The eyes always want to know what they missed. Readers can't see what they missed with a noun. It works if the question is specific enough, what did the new building look like? But most answers require verbs. To tell a story, a sentence needs a subject, a verb, and a direct object. News photos need the same construction. Photojournalists tell stories with their images. Also, words are always used in conjunction with a photojournalist's images. The words below a photo are called a cut line. Photojournalists should write the cut lines that go with their images. They should also know the most about the images and the story. To be a photojournalist, we must understand the relationship between the image and the basic building blocks of language, all languages worldwide. The girl hits or misses the ball. There are no other options. The girl is easy to photograph. The ball is easy to photograph. The verb is the hard part. As a servant of the citizens, it's the photojournalist's obligation to capture the entire sentence involved in every event. There are no excuses. It's hit or missed. A photojournalist is a visual reporter of facts. The public places trust in reporters to tell the truth. The same trust is extended to photojournalists as visual reporters. This responsibility is paramount to photojournalists. At all times, we have many thousands of people seeing through our eyes and expecting to see the truth. Most people immediately understand an image. In a world of grocery store tabloids and digital manipulation of images, the photojournalist must tell the truth. Photojournalists constantly hunt for images which tell of the day-to-day -day struggles and accomplishments of their communities. These occurrences happen naturally. There's no need to set up reality. There's no need to lie to a community that bestows its trust. In a nutshell, if a photojournalist isn't going to fake a fire or a murder, why would she or he set up a groundbreaking or person A giving person B an object, such as an award, check, or trophy? A photojournalist simply wants to hang around, be forgotten, and wait for the right moment. Then, the hunt begins anew. Like police officers or firefighters, photojournalists are concerned about their community, even if it means sacrificing comfort or life. Many photojournalists die each year in the process of collecting visual information, which let the public know of atrocities, danger, and the mundane. What makes a photojournalist different from a photographer? Photographers take pictures of nouns like people, places, and things. Photojournalists shoot action verbs, kick, explode, cry. Photojournalists do shoot some nouns. These nouns can be standard photos of people, such as portraits, places, such as proposed zoning areas or construction sites, and things, you can name it. However, the nouns we seek must still tell a story and are typically considered transitional elements in photo stories. Assignments and image holes. Reporters and editors should know how photojournalists work. We have holes to fill each day. Many photojournalists track events in our communities and anticipate what our readers expect to see. As a general rule, many daily community newspapers expect three page one news images and one to four inside black and white news or business images, as well as two to nine lifestyle images and two to five sports images. Metro newspapers expect more and have additional sections. Assignments are honored on a first-come, first-served basis, with some exceptions. Once a section has its initial image quota, priority shifts to another section until each section is safe. Then additional images are collected for future issues. Editorial news judgment is applied to image priority. Murder is more important than other planned occurrences. Unlike text reporters, visual reporters must be on location when events occur. Therefore, events with flexible time fall lower on a fixed priority scale, but have a greater overall editorial priority and may bump other items under time restrictions. Additionally, anything with front page potential usually has priority over section fronts and inside images. Since these are newspapers, here's the loose shooting priority. Breaking news including murders, hostages, natural disasters, and major wrecks. 
General news, including funerals, courts, perp walks, and dignitary visits. Photo essays. Major feature events. Sporting events. Festivals. Educational events. Feature photos. Advertising, non-spec. Illustrations. Mugshots, sports portraits, and other portraits. Competition. Most photojournalists succumb to the competitive nature of photo contests. Unlike other journalism competitions, which separate stories by circulation, most photojournalists and photographers compete head-to-head with their best images. The winner takes all. Consequently, additional enthusiasm and effort goes towards potentially competitive images. Graft and gifts. All a photojournalist should require is unlimited access and documents. As the citizen's servant, the photojournalist shouldn't accept anything other than water. If the photojournalist accepts gifts, any gifts, the photojournalist is perceived as corrupt and perpetuates the myth about evil media. Consequently, everyone immediately offers photojournalists gifts and favors, which should be kindly turned down. Coverage Zones In newspapers, there are coverage zones. Larger papers have larger pieces of turf. This zone is created by physical circulation geography, area of influence upon the circulation area, and predominant interests of the area. Outside of this area, the story must warrant leaving the community unattended by the photojournalist should breaking news occur. Assigned events outside the circulation zone can include spot news, general news such as funerals and court cases, portions of photo essays, championship level sporting events, and large events with an expected participation or spectator draw from the circulation area such as fairs, festivals, and exhibitions. Personal views about the job. This is not a glamorous job. A photojournalist is a servant, like a waitress or a sanitation worker. They're expected to be on the job around the clock to serve the public. News never stops. Again, news never stops. You sleep when you can. You eat when you're done. You're never really off the clock. Photojournalists are role models. They don't want to be, but they are. At a mid-sized or small newspaper, a photojournalist can't have a night on the town and neglect his or her city. Everyone from the little tykes to the senior citizens knows the photojournalist. Photojournalists are the visible portion of the newspaper. Photojournalists must crawl through barnyard dung for one shoot and arrive at the annual celebrity gala an hour later. Photojournalists love the communities we cover and the people who live in these wonderful places. We also love our job and this profession. The work is hard but satisfying and meaningful. I get all the good assignments. I'd like to say there's no such thing as a bad assignment. This isn't true. During monthly meetings in Dallas, we joke that someone gets all the good assignments. This means that someone made diamonds from coal. We even took it a step further and internalized this thought by saying, I get all the good assignments, which is true. A dedicated photojournalist can find a good image in every assignment. We understand this may be the first, last, or only time the subject will be in the newspaper, and they deserve our best effort. Most photojournalists have the exact same training as a reporter. Additionally, photojournalists take as many as eight photo-specific courses and an obligatory internship, if not two or three. Our electives were most likely in the hard sciences, including chemistry, sociology, anthropology, geology, physical geography, and biology. We all have degrees and a 3.5 GPA is considered a minimum. Trust me, we've moved beyond nouns. Give me some motion and emotion, then everything will be okay. How photojournalism affects the brain. Earlier, 
I said photojournalism is the most powerful medium. I expect you question this statement, so I'll provide some evidence. The eye is directly connected to the brain via the optic nerve. The eye and brain are in constant communication. The brain sends instruction to the eyes. The eyes respond with a movement called a saccade. The eyes collect visual information and immediately present it to the brain. Then the process repeats. Unlike written or spoken language, the brain can immediately understand the massive data presented and sort for meaning of visual information in milliseconds. Consequently, visual information is most immediate and visceral of all communication. While moving images, video and film, are the most engrossing, the still image is the most powerful. This is also due to the way the brain functions. Moving images force the eye to saccade as scenes change and objects move. However, the still image is frozen and allows time for the eye to fixate. For anything to become memorable, the brain must retrace neural connections several times to build up a chemical memory. This occurs during viewers' fixations. Once the data is chemically stored inside these connections, it's a memory. It can later be called upon with another chemical trigger. Essentially, if a still image is studied for a small amount of time, it becomes physically burned in the chemical markers of the brain. It's a chemical version of a rewritable compact disc. Every new image encountered is compared against the previously stored mental images. The brain might chemically say, Bob looks like Ted with gray hair instead of black and green eyes instead of blue. When it comes to photography, previously stored images are probably very famous photos and difficult to usurp. The most common or imperfect images in a set are dumped as different or unusual images are encountered. This is a point of impact for photojournalists. It's also what distinguishes the work of one from others. All of this falls squarely into the hands of the art snobs who claim everything that can be shot has been shot. Furthermore, it applies to everything that will be shot in the future. This is because enough similar images have been created that the most complex composition is only a minor change from previously viewed images of someone with a vast visual memory. This could be depressing if we dwell on it too long. It means the best photo we can make is only a minor adjustment from images that others have already made. It also means the judge of whatever contest we're about to enter has a 30-year visual library to compare our images against before she yells out. Here's where quality photojournalism work becomes powerful. Even minor verbs and subtle emotions separate a photojournalist's image from average images. It's different. The verbs we capture tap into pre-existing chemically stored emotional bonds of the viewers. These add several more neural connections and additional emotional meaning to the chemical memory. Our image may overwrite some other image in the viewer's mind, but could easily be lost with time and additional visual stimuli. How photojournalists make memorable images. Photojournalists can give viewers subjects in context with authority and create sympathy for empathy. These images are most compelling when combined with a powerful action verb and strong emotional content. Context. Most daily photojournalism work takes place in the real world. The backgrounds of our images aren't painted, they're real places. Often, they're real places where most daily viewers have visited. Viewers immediately connect the background to their own emotional memories of the place. Although location is important to subscribers, other viewers correlate the background to somewhere they have been. Although subtle, our images are already beginning to mean different things to each viewer. Images start to become unique to each viewer as their brain connect visual and emotional memories. This is most true with uniform environments such as sports. While photojournalists shoot peewee football games in the suburbs, the background may remind a former football player of his college days. The backgrounds we capture are enough to make an image memorable and connect with the viewer's emotions. Authority. In addition to context, photojournalistic images have authority. Our images are primarily facts. When viewers see our images published in the paper or on the web, they're viewed as facts. 
The cut line verifies the facts of the image for skeptical viewers. Most day-to-day -day images don't require this factor to connect to viewers' emotion, but images with new data require this authority, sympathy, and empathy. But our journalists want viewers to find parallels in our images to their own lives. This is why our work is sometimes called a reflection of the community. We show the community to itself. By doing so, the community connects deeply with the publication. If we can't get this level of sympathy or empathy between our image subjects and our readers, the images are unlikely to have any impact on the readers and are basically page fillers. We want readers to feel they have been there and done that and connect the image with every emotion they felt under similar stressful situations. Obviously, the impact of the image varies greatly from reader to reader. At the inexperienced end of the spectrum, empathy with the subject is probably created. Viewers may not feel the image, but they can imagine themselves in a similar situation and have an emotional response. Worldly readers may experience total sympathy with the subject. The image is immediately connected to deeply burned chemical trails in the brain. Painful memories are replayed and connected to the image on the page. They feel his emotion. They have sympathy. Powerful action verbs. Subjects with relatively passive verbs can still etch into the mind of viewer and connect to stored information deep within the viewer's own brain. When powerful action verbs are introduced to our images, images are most likely to affect viewers. Visual verbs such as fall, explode, slam, rip, summon defensive responses within the viewer's brain. Images which contain powerful action verbs can elicit physical reactions from viewers. Photojournalists want viewers to have these gut reactions. This means our image was connected by the viewer to additional nerve centers within their body. The image isn't simply mental, but becomes physical as well. In other words, it'll be remembered for a while. In addition to the neural traces, it now has physical reinforcement. While the physical reaction isn't as obvious, brains connect viewers' emotional content to images. The physical reaction is more on a cellular nervous system level than a muscular reaction. Viewer's skin may tingle, stomachs may clench, tears may form. These are all physical manifestations of emotional reactions to chemically stored images within the brain. Many emotions have become verbs. Scream and cry are common examples. Other emotions, such as fear or pain, are implied and understood by the viewer from facial expressions. These emotions are best displayed on the subject's face. This is why most editors want to clearly see people's faces. Body language or position alone can also convey the emotion without the ability to see the subject's face. However, readers can more rapidly and effectively connect directly to the subject if the subject's eyes are visible and in focus. The viewer feels the emotion while seeing the image. We want to tap into the viewer's feeling to maximize the impact of our image. As such, viewers are likely to absorb images completely when emotional elements are introduced. Rather than dwelling on the obvious, let's understand this is the key to a successful image. Photojournalism's goal. The goal of photojournalism is to communicate with viewers through truthful images and words. If we place subjects in context and create sympathy or empathy while documenting a powerful action verb and strong emotional content, we have succeeded. When combined, these ingredients connect multiple neural and physical chemical pathways to a mental image for the viewer. If successful, we've overwritten many previous images in the viewer's brain chemistry. If all of this can be done while presenting a new word to our viewers, we've created something truly worthy of our viewers' time. A new word. Photojournalism shares many qualities with our writing partners. I've already discussed the need for complete visual sentences containing a noun, verb, and direct object. However, a journalist must have a certain flair for the language to challenge readers. So must the photojournalist. When I'm reading a news story, I'm occasionally stopped by a new word. I'll try to reason the meaning of the word from the story context surrounding the words. 
I also consider similar English and Latin words. If this doesn't work, I get a dictionary and find the meaning. I enjoy the process and see each new word as a personal challenge. The same holds true for photography. While readers are scanning the pages or browsing the website, we need to stop them with a new visual word. The image still contains all the story elements previously discussed, but it must somehow be new and interesting. We want a normal reader to think, what the heck is that? We want to force the reader to look at the image for supporting information as to the meaning of the image. If the viewer still can't understand the meaning of the image, they can read the cut line as a definition for the image. Then, being fully informed, the image has more meaning for the viewer. The image suddenly makes sense. This is the goal. It isn't easy to achieve this kind of image. To make these images, photojournalists must look hard to find the image. Just as great writers struggle for the exact word, photojournalists walk a tightrope themselves to find the right combination of framing, lenses, lights, emotion, action for the right image. When the right word comes to mind, it's a eureka moment for the writer and the photojournalist alike. Enough for now.